brief statement of what Options 360 is about, a nonprofit <coughs> women's clinic equipping women of Southwest Washington to make healthy choices and to choose life for themselves and their unborn babies. Uh, I do know that uh, just two little factoids, they saw over 1,100 women during the last uh, calendar year, and they participated in the safe arrival of several hundred uh, babies. Now, and that's all I've got to say about the clinic, but what we have is an opportunity to participate in supporting the clinic. They have what is called the baby bottle drive, and in the lobby there is a table with a number of baby bottles. Now, but first, a quiz question. If you are a millennial or younger, there aren't enough, there are a lot of you here. Okay, I have a shiny object, uh, flat, round, flat, with George Washington's portrait on the front. What do we call that object? Anyone know? Boomers, you have to keep quiet. Young people, millennials. Oh, by the way, 1981 or later, if you were born since 1981, what is this object? Excellent, a quarter, a very bright young lady uh, over here. Who is that? Are you a millennial? You are, congratulations, a quarter. Now this, a quarter is a part of a subset, is a subset of a class of those coins. Coins together with bills constitute currency or cash. Now for you young people, cash is what your parents and grandparents used to buy things. I know that you think that money just magically comes out of your cell phones, and so it does. But in prior times, we had to use cash, coins, bills, currency, to make purchases. The bottle drive is an old school approach. If you have spare cash, spare change, spare bills, put them in the baby bottle, collect them over the next month, and uh, Bring it back to church roughly mid-July. We'll be collecting the bottles. So save as much cash as you can. But you, if you think that you, dealing with cash is totally weird, I just use my phone to make purchases. You can use your phone, go to the Options 360 website, and you can give them cash with your phone. Another old school approach, you can just write a check. Another, you know, a, a, a tradition we had years ago. You can write a check, put it in the bottle, bring it back in mid-July. So that is what I have. Grab a bottle and a brochure to learn more about the ministry. And uh, we'll see you in mid-July with your bottles hopefully filled with cash or checks. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Ken. I know that's a wonderful way to just use up some change around the house, and we've been able to bless that ministry before, and we hope to do it again. All right, please uh, join me in prayer as we dedicate this time to our Lord. Well, our Father, we thank you for bringing us together today as your family and as your church. Uh, please work amongst us, Lord, in powerful ways so that your name will be made great in our hearts and great in our church and also in our households. Bring us closer together, Father, through the one another's of our membership together in your church as we bear with one another, we love one another, encourage one another. We ask that our gathering this morning could be used toward that end, so that as we grow in one another, we grow in you. As we increase in our love for each other, we increase in our love for you and for your gospel. Please be with all of our ministries this morning, from the children on up to the adults, that we could all know with one voice your son and your will for us in your word. We ask that you would convict us of our faults, Lord, showing us the ways that we have failed to walk in manners worthy of our calling, how we have been short with our families, with one another, with people at work, where we have failed to act in grace and in mercy toward each other. But Lord, we know that you alone are capable of these things because you alone have worked out salvation for your people. And toward that end, we ask that our worship would be fitting to you, that you would unite us in song and intentionality as we praise you with our hearts this morning. May you do great wonders here this morning through your grace and your power at work within us. Amen. All right, please stand with me and we'll hear our Lord call us to worship. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. 
Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship him, bow down. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the sheep of his pasture and the people of his hand. together. 
Well, our scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 63, 1 through 4. Uh, follow along with me now. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary beholding your power in glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you, so I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. So how many of us can actually and honestly say that this is the posture of our hearts? Or even at our best ever has been the case. Our soul thirsts, our flesh faints, but think about it, it's not because of life's difficulties that that happens, but because of how great God is. He is so great that he is refreshing to us as if we were actually dying of thirst. For the psalmist, in order to have this profound type of experiential faith, he must keep his eyes fixed on the sanctuary of God, on his power and on his glory. He knows that the love of God is, uh, is more than, than this life can bring. It's greater than anything that this world can produce. And praise is his response, which is an example to us of our Sunday morning worship. We make God's name great among us by being refreshed through his word by his spirit and by one another, then by responding in worship together. And we'll see in just a few moments in the sermon that this was the, per the perspective of Stephen, who was able to count uh, the joy before him and endure trial and eventually death, just as Jesus did for us on the cross, counting it all joy and then dying on our behalf. Amazing truth. Let's stand again and, and continue singing.
Seems like the older I get, the smaller words get on anything printed. So, I mean, but yeah, anyways, <laughs> that's the way it is there. Um, deep breath, now I'm all set. We uh, left off, I want to give us a little recap of where we've been in Acts. The book can be summed up. Uh, in what Jesus told the, the disciples in chapter one, which was, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then the whole book proceeds out of that as we have been learning. Well, after that beginning part, then there was Peter's sermon at Pentecost. Um, where Jesus was proclaimed as Messiah and whom the prophets spoke. And Peter said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And then the believers fellowshiped. Then there was that time where Peter and John healed the lame beggar guy and Peter gave his second sermon. Uh, and in that one, to sum up, he said, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob glorified his servant Jesus, whom you crucified. That was the point he made there. And he even said, he said, God made the times and he spoke of this through Moses. And he even referenced Deuteronomy 18, which we'll get to later. Well, then Peter and John were before the council and they told the council, salvation is in no one else but Jesus. We must obey God and speak to what we have seen and heard. And then they got back with the other believers and they all prayed for boldness and the whole place shook. Well, then at the end of uh, chapter five, they all met in Solomon's portico and many signs and wonders were done among them at the hands of the apostles. And uh, even as they were being uh, held captive in jail, the angel came and set them uh, free and told them, go stand in the temple and speak these words of life. And so Peter's message altogether summarized is probably something like this. Jesus is Messiah, Lord and Savior. You killed him, the author of life. Repent and believe. And that's the short Cliff Notes version of Peter's sermon. Well, let's uh, turn uh, in our Bibles today and read Acts 6, uh, starting in verse 8. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freed men, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians and of the Alexandrians and of those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly instigated men who said, We've heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. But we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. And the high priest said, are these things so? We're going to leave it there for today. We'll move on to the next stuff next week. But uh, that's our topic today. And uh, before we get going any further, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word, for your truth, 
for how you teach us, how you uh, shape our lives. Thank you for the examples you give us in Scripture and for your word that is life to us uh, in Scripture. Thank you for your word being living and active. And we ask that you permeate our hearts, our minds today. Help us to listen well, to receive what you have for us, that we might uh, continue to submit our lives, our heart, our soul to you, um, to be uh, submitted to abide in you, we ask. Help us in that process today, and, and uh, we commit this time to you. Amen. Uh, well, playing uh, music, uh, it's pretty simple. I'm changing the subject, I know, but uh, just to say, it, it is pretty simple. All you have to do is play the right note at the right time, okay? Um, similarly, being a Christian is very simple. All you have to do is live like Jesus. Okay? It's not complicated. It's just costly. It costs everything to follow Jesus, and yet his salvation, his forgiveness of sins, eternal life in him is his free gift. We can't earn it. And yet abiding in Christ requires our complete surrender. We've got to be all in. Stephen was all in. Flashback if, with me here to uh, Jesus, his Sermon on the Mount. He says, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And with all of that in mind, Let's consider our text today. Who are the players in this passage? There's Stephen, of course. Uh, he's one of the seven that we talked about last week that were appointed to serve. And he's a, a Hellenist. He's Greek. And then there are some of those that belong to the synagogue of the freed men among them. And it says as they were so called, right? That was their, their moniker, I guess. Um, freed men would be those that were uh, freed slaves or offspring of freed slaves. And among them, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia. So they're from the diaspora, the, the Jews that are scattered abroad. And they were Hellenists, that is, they were Greek-speaking uh, Jews. So these guys who are devout Jews, they're, but they're from far away. So coming to Jerusalem speaks to their devotion. That's how committed they were. They weren't like nominal Jews off in a foreign land that, you know, talked about Jerusalem and someday. They were guys that went there. So let's be reminded of this context as well. Jerusalem is the epicenter of God's kingdom. It's where the temple is. God's dwelling among his people. Now, devout Jews were expecting God to intervene with the Roman occupation in Jerusalem. God did, in fact, intervene, not only with the Roman occupation, but with the much larger issue of sin, which plagues all of humanity. God intervened in Jerusalem among his people via Jesus, the fulfillment of the temple. This is the message that the apostles and the disciples were preaching. God's intervention had come, just not in the way that most people had been expecting it. But when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples and signs and wonders were being done and the bond of Christ's love evident among the believers was apparent and undeniable, the apple cart, so to speak, was upset. This was all controversial and exciting. Emotions were high. Love and opposition. Those who were intent on keeping order, the status quo, they were agitated. We've seen that in the religious leaders already. Their world was being upset. Their understanding challenged. 
their identity and pride was shaken. So today's passage shows that even those devout Jews from afar were also concerned and upset. They debated with one of their own, Stephen. But they could not refute his arguments. Perhaps they were skeptical of the signs and wonders, or maybe they were put off by Stephen's grace and power. So they debated. They challenged him with their knowledge of Torah, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit in which he was speaking. Remember Jesus' words, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. So here's Stephen being a powerful witness. Though this text doesn't tell us explicitly, we can safely presume that Stephen was teaching and debating the same truth that Jesus taught and that the apostles were preaching. Same message, Jesus is Messiah, the fulfillment of the law, the true temple, Emmanuel, God with us. You guys killed him, the author of life, but he provides forgiveness of sins and eternal life. So repent and be saved. These devout Hellenist Jews would have none of it, but they couldn't refute him. So they took a different tack. They secretly instigated rumors and lies. Isn't that the way it goes? Can't win the argument, so we begin the smear campaign. This sounds like politics. It was a grasping for power which they didn't have. Does that sound familiar? Who was it that fell from heaven trying to grasp power and so deceived humanity in the first place? This scene with Stephen and his opponents is a microcosm of God's triumph over evil. It's the gospel. The same elements are at play. What Satan tried to do with God, what the religious leaders tried to do with Jesus, is being played out again here with Stephen. Same tactics, same result. Just compare Stephen with Jesus. Here's what Jesus did. He proclaimed God's kingdom. Matthew tells us that Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. When John the Apostle sums up his ministry this way, he says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Well, Jesus faced opposition of religious leaders. He was accused of blasphemy, even though he knew and taught God's word rightly. And he died at the hands of angry men. Jesus came full of grace and truth. The word became flesh, made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. In verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Well, Stephen was full of grace and power. Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. And then in our text today, now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Well, what great signs and wonders did Stephen do? We aren't told, are we? We are told what signs and wonders Jesus did so that we might believe in him. We believe in Jesus, not Stephen. Jesus is our Savior, not Stephen. Even so, Stephen is a good example of following Jesus. 
Similarly, we follow mentors and leaders who follow Christ. They are not our savior. They are only pointing to Jesus. So when we live in Jesus, we point to Jesus. So what was the opposition's lie? Verse 14 in our text is a clue. Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place, when they're talking about the temple, and will change the customs Moses delivered, which they're talking about the law. That's what they're accusing Stephen of. Well, remember what God told Moses. He says, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. Peter quotes this same verse back a few sermons ago. Remember what Jesus told the religious leaders. He said, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Well, is Jesus greater than Moses? We all nod and say yes, right? Because scripture tells us so, Hebrews. This hasn't been written yet probably, unless maybe Stephen wrote it in his spare time between being a deacon and, yeah, I don't think so. Um, Hebrews chapter three, therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Jesus had been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. But Christ is faithful as the Son over God's house, and we are his house, if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. So here is the accusation against Stephen. Uh, blasphemy against Moses and God. In verse 11. Verse 13 says, Never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. And in verse 14, For we have heard him say Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and the customs Moses delivered to us. Curiously, Jesus taught these same things. Jesus was crucified under these same allegations. Stephen was teaching that Jesus is the true temple and that he is the one Moses looked forward to. Moses foreshadowed Jesus, deliverer, intercessor, lawgiver. Jesus came to fulfill the law, not abolish it. Remember what Jesus taught. Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Remember that phrase, uh, this verse here. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, Jesus challenged the thinking that the law can save us. That if we're good enough, God will let us into his kingdom. The law was given to point us to Messiah showing that we are incapable of God's righteousness and in need of a savior. Jesus is that savior. This was the message the uh, apostles and Stephen taught and preached. Next week, we'll get to read through Stephen's actual presentation of that. Notice the verbs in our text in verse 12. They set up false witnesses. They secretly instigated they stirred up people and elders and scribes. They seized Stephen. They brought him in before the council. 
Now remember that these were religious leaders bent on keeping the law. Laws such as you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. And wisdom such as an honest witness does not deceive but a false witness pours out lies. Be not a witness against your neighbor without cause and do not deceive with your lips. They would have known this. Why would they so blatantly do what they did? Because verse 10, they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Like I said earlier, all of this sounds familiar. These same things happened to Jesus. These guys went from debating theology to slander and lies and to violence. Sadly, when debate fails, we often resort to slander in a campaign of lies. I mean, just look at the internet. Social media is home to this stuff. It takes godly wisdom to discern truth from lies. We gain godly wisdom by following Jesus, not by following the teachers of the law. God's word rather than man's words. Remember that Jesus is the word become flesh. He is the way, the truth, and the life. The chatter and the folly that we see and that we swim in so much in our world is merely a distraction from the truth. Look at Jesus. All the other stuff then falls into place. Verse 15 in our text. All who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Face of an angel. What does that really mean? Angels are God's supernatural messengers. It's interesting that Stephen's face was like that of an angel. It reminds me of this scene in Exodus. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and the, all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant and they were afraid to come near him. Coincidence? Angelic glow that Stephen had? The high priest must have been taken aback at this. Here was Stephen, face of an angel, and these angry guys accusing him of blasphemy. What a contrast. Almost like an unblemished lamb being led to slaughter. Well, what do we do with a text like this? There's some obvious things, you know, be like Stephen, full of grace and power, know God's word, what it means, just like Stephen did. All of these things relate to uh, what Paul wrote to the Ephesians and by extension to us. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. Paul's prayer for the Ephesians is this, he says, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirits in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. 
Amen. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. What we see, what we see in Stephen is a man walking in the calling to which he had been called. And it cost him everything to the point of death. But he was able to walk so because of Christ's power at work within him. Stephen was just the first of many martyrs. In fact, the word martyr means witness. To bear witness to Christ is to die to self. Sometimes that means having to part with the flesh earlier than expected. perhaps even at the hands of angry men. But comprehending with all the saints the height and depth and breadth and length and the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge prepares us and equips us to die. First to self, our selfish desires, our comforts, our plans. When we taste what it is to abide in Christ's love, those other things begin to fade in comparison. The shiny objects lose their appeal. The love of Christ enables us to walk in a manner worthy of his calling, in gentleness and humility, with patience and love. He gives us his grace, he fills us with his spirit. He strengthens us for each moment in his power. For we have received power as the Holy Spirit has come upon us and as we are witnesses to the ends of the earth. Blessed are you when others revile you persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So let us walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we have been called, bearing witness to Christ boldly with gentleness and humility, in his strength and power. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your strength and power, for your salvation, your grace to us, how you uh, shape and mold us, how you take the uh, mess-ups that we have in our lives, the things done to us, the things that we do to ourselves, the things that we do to others, and you make these things right. Thank you for your righteousness and that you clothe us with your righteousness. Help us as we seek to abide in you, to walk in you, worthy of the calling that you have called. Commit this time, and we thank you in Jesus. Amen. Well, let's stand and, and sing.
Titus, which is a good benediction for us today. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. Uh, we have our discussion time and we have potluck uh, glorious day. So, and we miss the ladies. It's uh, awfully quiet and subdued, it seems, with a bunch of room gone at the ladies' retreat. At least that's how my house was this weekend. So, before there it is, it's on the air.